Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Table Talk Radio Show. I am your host. My name is Tanisha Simpkins, and we welcome you guys on tonight. Um, I do have other hosts, our co-host, Dr. Lee. How are you tonight? Hey, I'm good. Good, good, good. And we have some guests with us tonight. We have Sarah. How are you? I'm well of yourself. Good, good, good. And we also have Pastor David Rosa. How are you tonight, sir? I am well, a little tired from the past weekend, but I'm all right. You know, that's that's I, I when I sent out a message earlier today to Dr. Lee and Pastor Austin, who's our other co-host, I put um it's exhausting. It's been an exhausting weekend if you participated in what's going on on the grounds or if you participated um, by helping out with social media, telling locations, um, giving your stance, uh, but it's been exhausting. And the thing about it is some people thought that after the weekend, oh. y'all hear me, that it just oh. stops. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that it's just supposed to just stop. And, and you know, that's not the case. And, you know, uh, Pastor David, I know that you were um, one of the ones that were at the Fort Lauderdale area this Saturday. And you also gave the closing um, prayer there um, this Saturday. Um, how was it? How was the atmosphere? Yeah, it was actually yesterday. It was on Sunday. Pentecost Sunday. I'm you sorry, know, I'm the Sunday. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, it's Sunday. It was Pentecost Sunday. And uh, I actually opened up uh, the event in prayer and then closed it in prayer. So um, so we were there for the, the, the entire duration of the event. Uh, man, listen, it was powerful. Um, the energy was incredible. Uh, I mean, we had such a show of support. Um, and our Black Lives Matter um, organizers and Dream Defender organizers here in Broward, they are incredible. Uh, they put mm -hmm. together an incredible action. Uh, you know, shout out to my sister, uh, Jasmine Shaw, Asa Shaw, uh, Tiffany, um, you know, Shervin Jones is out there with us. Um, and so many more that put it together. But I just got to tell you, uh, man, what they put together was just uh, incredible. It was great, effective, organized. Um, you know, I started the event by making sure that I said to the people, I did my prayer gave my little pastoral eloquent uh, talk. And then I said, <laughs> but let me just uh, let y'all know something to the uh, crowd of about 2000. I said, I'm saved, but I'm not soft. Y'all not about to come to our crib and just tear up however you want to. I said, so, you know, let's, let's be angry. Uh, let's, 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 you know, uh, make our voices heard. But if you're not from around here, don't come tearing up our crib. And, um, you know, uh, it almost went without uh, without any kind of real issues. We had a couple of little small things that try to uh, happen. Somebody try to uh, light up a flag by the police station. I just asked to put that on the street. Not, not I just told y'all we're not doing this. So take it to the street. Do that there. Um, and it went off without an issue. I closed us out in prayer, set everybody off home. Uh, called um, the organizers, made sure all our organizers had left there. Um, we told our crowd, the people that came with us to the protest, all right, let's go home. Everybody left that was there for our protest, right. the whole home team. Whatever happened after that was whatever happened after that with whoever that was, but it wasn't our people. So I'm proud of South Florida, proud of uh, our Black Lives Matter community, Dream Defenders. It was It was incredible, powerful. And they not only did the um, event uh, organize it there in Fort Lauderdale, Broward, but they also did in Dade County as well. And it went off wonderful. And I know that yesterday by the American Ring, uh, I think it was by the American Arena, right? Um, mm -hmm. It went off. I seen the beginning. One of my friends, she was videoing actually, um, I can't think of her name. And, and then at the end, when they ended up, and at the end, it was like almost time to go. I said, all right, now you and your family can go home. Don't stick around because, mm -hmm. you know, after you see certain movement, you know, you know that it, it, it's, it's time to go. You know how the police are. And a lot of people don't realize that the police uh, department, they're trained for protests. So the mindset that they have trained for protests is aggressiveness, you know, 
um, sometimes too far of an, of an extent, as we've seen um, in the news, but that's what they're trained for. Um, and I know that there are some things that, Teresha, Dr. Teresha Lee, that you said that there are three things that we should actually know when it comes to protesting. Yes, I did. After um, viewing the protest and um, people speaking out this weekend and even having close family members of mine um, participate in protests and hands up and they were still pepper sprayed, you know, um, crowds that were standing and chanting being attacked by horses. Um, and I've seen this in several states because my family's a bit of everywhere. Um, I had to say something. Um, so last night I got on my Instagram and my Facebook and I posted a quick video. Um, it's, it's less than five minutes because I know people don't want to get on social media and watch long videos. But um, it was just three things that you needed to know before protesting. And that first one was just knowing your strength. Um, everybody is not built to protest. Everybody does not have the tolerance for it. Even in the 1960s, there were trainings that our ancestors went through. And some people did not qualify to go right. on the front lines because their temperament did not allow them to sit through the torment. If you know that's not your, your area, stick with your strengths. This isn't a time to test your weaknesses if you know you don't have the temperament for it. The second one was also know your limits. The videos, the pictures, the stories, it can be a lot. When dealing with a pandemic and a protest is double. So know your limits. If you know you have no way to healthy, in a healthy manner process the videos, pictures, and images that you are seeing, know when to say when. Don't do that to yourself. And then you are mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually fatigued with no outlet. Know your strengths, first of all, but know your limits, secondly. And last but not least, know your purpose. Everyone has a purpose. And I pray that that purpose not only enriches your life, but enriches other people's lives. And in doing that, that means that we all function in different ways. So you may not be a protester. You may be one of those people that needs to write a check. You may be one of those people that needs to write Amen. a letter, that needs to go to the Capitol. You may, there's so many ways that we all function in purpose and can speak out and speak up for people who don't have voices. Don't think that because you aren't protesting, you aren't doing something because you can. So just those three, know your limits, know your strengths and know your purpose. That's good, that's good. And what are some other things, you know, um, I'll tell, I'll talk to you, Serica, you know, when it comes to protesting, because, you know, some people can be very vocal um, because a lot of times, sometimes they already come there with anger, you know, just like what, 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 what David was saying, you know, one guy ready to do this when, when everybody is already peaceful, you know, what do you think as far as when protesting, we should need, we need to know. Um, I, I wouldn't call myself a expert on protest. I, I have protested um, before um, and, I, and I continue to do so when I'm able. Um, but I will say um, with anger, um, I'm not the one to try to tell somebody how to uh, express how they feel. Um, however, if I know that individual um, personally, um, I will say something I mean, at a protest. You're, it's very hard for you to try to govern all those people and yourself because you you also mm. have your anger and and how you feel that you're carrying out there as well. So um, I can remember cost being protesting uh, not too long ago here in Pompano when a man was killed by the police officers in his backyard. And I'm protesting in the rain and protesting in the hot sun. And it's very easy for a lot of people on the sideline to look at and say what you should say and how you should act and how you should feel, but they're not out there walking in the sun. They're not there while the police are constantly antagonizing you. They're not out there doing that. So uh, it, it really takes a lot of restraint and self-control to, to protest. Um, I'm, I'm a very vocal person and, and I don't really 
I don't cover what I have to say because of who's in the building. <laughs> I say what I have to say right. regardless. Um, so I don't cower to to anybody because my life is just as important as your life. Your your position does not put you above me. So I don't cower in that sense, but I try to be respectful as much as possible. Um, so I will say, you know, definitely when it comes to the anger that people are expressing right now, um, this isn't this isn't an anger that's unfounded or without merit. Um, this isn't an anger that people uh, know how to deal with because first there isn't there are people who are willing to this government for one law enforcement they are not even acknowledging what they are doing for us to even calm down from the anger um, and, and that's that's as simple as just listen if if someone does something to make you mad and you tell them what they're doing and they keep doing it you're not going to just sit there and just be like okay i'm going to take this and i'm going to figure out how to do this especially if you don't have a choice of being there you think about kids growing up in abusive and abusive uh, households where their parents constantly abuse them and they're angry and they want to say how they feel and they want to get away and they want better and they're not able to do that because that's where they are. They're kids. They're not able to do that. So until they are able to leave, until they're able financially to be on their own, then they can start choosing, are, am I going to do what I'm seeing, what I grew up doing, or I'm going to do the opposite? So, you know, with the anger for people, All right. listen, I try to tell people, listen, just calm yourself as much as you can, and I just don't judge. Oh. Ms. Simpkins, can Pastor I say something? Pastor A, are you there? Me? I'm here. Can you guys sure. hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. I was just going to ask you, how did you feel in regards to the protest before David starts? Um, did you, like, you um, as know, it pertains speak to the to protest? Uh, um, I hear everyone speaking about anger, and anger is great. Uh, even right. the Bible gives us credence for anger. Um, it, it says, be angry, and then it says, but sin not. And so a lot of people, you know, we, we try to judge anger. And so the, the sin, oh. if you will, is not in the anger. Uh, I think I think it's um, universally recognized at this point, based upon everything that's happened, that everyone has a right to be angry. I think that we have to check your character card if you're not angry at this point. Um, because this issue mm. that we're dealing with is not, I don't look at it necessarily as a color issue um, this is a humanity issue, and anybody um, that was treated the way um, George, George Floyd was treated, uh, as a human, I'm angry. Um, as it relates to what we've been seeing, um, that that is that is the point to where we we say the sin not, and not not for the sake of for me, it is for the sake of what we're seeing now in our streets is opportunity for the narrative to be changed. And so we move from um, protesting um, the ability to be angry about the situation to now the focus is on the looting and the rioting. Uh, MLK said it best, rioting is the language of the unheard. And, and so oftentimes, as was just mentioned, some people don't know what else to do. Um, if we kneel silently, it's an issue and you get your right. job gets lost. Um, so silent protests doesn't always work. And so now the frustration is the, the, the mob um, protests. That's not necessarily appreciated either. So at some point, people are just not going to appreciate you protesting. I think we just have to understand that. that some people just don't want you to protest. They don't care how you do it, whether you kneel at a football game before the anthem or you stand peacefully. There are just some people that's just not going to agree with that. And so I'm not so boisterous about people looting. I am upset at the fact that it's, it's changing the narrative. The story is trying to shift in a little bit. And I'm kind of angry at parents allowing their kids to kind of do some of the stuff that they're doing. But that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. Go ahead, David. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say real quick that 
when we talk about uh, protesting or direct action, uh, and we talk about a nonviolent campaign or a protest, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into doing that healthily, right? Like that, that's not something we don't, uh, organizers or people that are, uh, that are knowledgeable in this area, it's, it's not a matter of something bad happened, I just, or I think something bad happened, so I just kind of go out there and start marching. Uh, Dr. King talked about six steps of a nonviolent uh, direct action. And uh, for him, that began with gathering information, making sure that what I'm getting ready to march and protest about is a righteous cause, right? Uh, so it wasn't just anything, but we're marching, protesting about specific things. Um, so we're gathering information. The next step he talks about is educating others, making sure that other people, right. your community, et cetera, know about what's going on uh, so that you could do it as a communal thing, a collective thing. Then he goes into uh, talking about the personal commitment, uh, talking about can you commit to this nonviolent cause? Are you going to follow through or are you just going to make some noise? Um, he continues to talk about negotiations, right? And then this part of the process, this is step four, is when we get together with people in power and say, hey, these are the issues going on. Can we speak to this? Can we, can we talk about what's going on and see if we can negotiate? And so we do that, right? But what we find and what Dr. King spoke about was that when we go to the negotiating table, we'll shake hands and get off that table. And there'll be a negotiation that we've come to, but nine times out of 10, power is going back, back, they're going to change their mind about it. They're going to say, you know what, we, we, for whatever reason, you know, it's too early. Uh, we can't do that right now. Uh, they're going to back out of it. At that point, right, after the fourth step is when the direct action now happens. Now we take out to the streets. Now we begin to boycott, et cetera. And then he finishes with uh, a point of reconciliation. How do we come back together? as a community and in unity. If we jump to direct action before doing the information gathering, educating others, uh, checking to see where our heart is in the matter, making sure we've got peace in ourselves, et cetera. If we jump to direct action, we're always going to do it in a way uh, that's less effective and less healthy. And I'll tell you what, if you do that too much, you're going to find yourself uh, in, in a deep, dark state. You can't do this too long without becoming emotionally unhealthy if you don't have a, a system to do it in a healthy way. And so I think it's important, especially for our young folk to know, man, we're not just going out here just doing whatever. Um, you know, we, there, there's a process we want to do this with. Okay. So um, I do have someone. I have um, Arthur um, oh. Terry Terry. Um, just saying that we have to scratch right for jump and go blind. So once this is over, um, um, Pastor David, can you put just some of the organizers um, who are available, like Defenders, um, Dream Defenders, and like Black Lives Matters, if you can hashtag or you can just mm -hmm. um, highlight their name so some people can know, because some people don't know who to get in contact with or how is it organized. You do. I don't, you don't have to be a part of an organization. Like I'm a part of Color of Change. You don't have to be a part of an organization. They just want, maybe want just the information um, to get out there. Sarah, are you about to say something? Yes, um, I was going to say something, and um, yes. and I'm actually glad um, we have a couple of pastors on here because um, most of the time, our pastors they uh, use Dr. King's uh, method and approach. Um, um, for civil rights as a, uh, a blueprint to follow. And um, I'm more of a Malcolm X, Angela um, Davis type person. So uh, while, I, while I appreciate and, and I understand all of uh, Dr. King's contributions to what we have done, understand that even in his approach and his nonviolence, they killed him. Even in his last years of protesting, he knew and felt that he had done it wrong. He took the wrong path. And I'm not, I don't think it was all wrong. I do believe Martin needed Malcolm and Malcolm needed Martin. It, it will speak more to come in peace, but be ready for war. And I, I don't just want us to be constantly spewing not spewing, constantly using Dr. King as our end all be all of how to approach the system because we tried it 
and they were he was murdered. We've tried that and it didn't work. And I put up a post today and it is, it, you know, it's basically stating that, you know, we have a lot of people that saying this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. This isn't going to work yet. And still tell me what will work and what has worked and what has gotten us to that place where there's an end of police brutality what has gotten us to a place where there is there is racial uh equities where there's no racial injustices where where is that place in america because it does not exist yet so for someone or anyone to say this isn't the way then which way do we go? Because no one is there yet. You're standing in the same place we're standing. Now, I do know that we, we do need more organization. That is absolutely our biggest issue as far as our organization. But I don't, I don't like the whole approach of just Dr. King and the nonviolence when this man was murdered. This man was murdered a father, a husband, a leader and if that doesn't even just send chills through your body right now he was murdered being a leader leaving the community speaking nonviolence, being arrested multiple times beaten while he was pro protesting tell me what is different from then to now to say let's continue to do that malcolm was an any many means by necessary type person and and that's where, honestly where I am with it because I have children and I have seen what my grandparents have gone through. I have grandparents that can remember a time when they couldn't go drink out of a water fountain. And I know that there are some people who still live who were enforcing those laws. So if, if we are now in a place where we're still seeing the things that our grandparents seen and we are trying to figure out what to do. We can, we cannot think that what was done before is the way to do it because it didn't work. We need something new. I'm not saying that this is the way, but don't say that this isn't the way when we don't even know where this is going to take us. Right, right. And Couldn't so that's agree with so um so i would say to um pastor david and, and to nathan what are we expecting from the church you know back then during that time uh there were mostly church leaders who led the protests and um Teresa, i can add you in this as well dr lee what are we expecting from the church nathan can you hear me i can hear you can you hear me fine I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, it, it's a very difficult position for the church to advocate violence, unfortunately. Um, my question in that regard is violence against or towards who? Uh, that would have to be the question that would have to be raised when we're, you know, we're talking about violence. Um, uh, that that would be, of course, the number one. The number one means. Personally, I've always been under the belief that in most cases, and, and we see it happening now. I believe that our anger and even our violence is not really geared towards the right people. Um, most of the, you know, most of the things that were happening in Minneapolis, the first place they went to was the police department. They, they they tried to burn that down. Now, for me. That wasn't the way to go. The police department had done, at least the chief at that moment, had done everything in his power uh, that he could do, which was firing the officers. Now, uh, me being a judicial assistant for 10 years, I understand the power of the legal system and the state attorneys. Most times our issues are with the state attorney's office, which is the case now. The biggest cry now is the state attorney officer office undercharging and then not charging the other three but nowhere do we see or hear that area even being approached attacked, or whatever you want to do to it we don't we usually don't know and someone talked about earlier about strategizing we don't know where every election most times the state attorney 
flies way under the radar. And in every case like this, they're the ones that have the most power. They have the power to bring charges. They have the power to prosecute in the matter that it needs to be prosecuted. Most of these cases don't get prosecuted with the same level of aggression that most African-Americans, I've seen it in courtrooms. I was in a criminal courtroom. I saw how uh, prosecutors pick and choose how they were going to prosecute cases. And so I think we have to begin to focus on the legal portion of this. That's the only way that Pastor a. is going to be the change. Yes. Okay, but Pastor A, that that yes. that necessarily we must do. That that's a must when it comes to our state attorneys in any state or any county. Uh, we should um, hold them accountable. But I want to know what are we expecting from the church? Some people say they expect their pastors to be vocal, to say something. Like I have friends that say, "Well, my pastor ain't saying nothing," because you know people people look to you know, unfortunately, Facebook and, and live stream for our pastors or people to say something, to get out there something, or to us send a letter, you know, send a letter, you know, to the church or or whatever it is that you know their process of communication is. But what are we expecting? Um, some people say, well, Tanisha, you had a diverse church. Uh, what did your pastor say? Did he have something to say? You know, he's a white man. You know, we're just going to keep it real. So, what are we expecting the churches to do? Are we expecting them to say, okay, so so we did this this week. So oh. next week we're gonna we're gonna participate. You know, and and come out and and be a part of the program. Protest, or are they expecting, you know, like, um, are, are they going to be out there, you know, well, let me just pass out some waters um, because people have an expectation, you know, that's why you have more young people out there. Older people want to get out there too. They really do. They, they really, really do. Uh, but they, but it's, it's like David, they waiting for someone, you know, because, because our pastors are our voice in a lot of places in a lot of black communities. They're waiting for someone um, to pull them. They're waiting for specific leaders. And to this point, I said on a, a, another show, who are our leaders in South Florida? Because mm. we, 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 we're looking for a leader. I think that's void in South ahead, Florida David. right now. Go ahead. Uh, so you can fit it. You could pass it. You can go ahead and finish what you were going to say. I'll, I'll address it right after. No, I was I was saying, you know, as far as South Florida is concerned, I don't know of any out front, you know, uh, before his illness, uh, Victor T. Curry was a great advocate. He was the voice, at least of Dade County and probably even Broward County as well. Uh, we you know, we've lost that voice um, due, due to his illness. But um, I think that is true. But I think um, Tanisha, you was leading towards something. Uh, and I think it will be more powerful. This is the this is the opportunity for um, our right brothers and sisters to kind of, if not lead the charge, be with us on the front line. Because for years and decades, the black pastors were the ones leading the charge, and unfortunately, it has not resulted in very much. But I do I do think that we must be vocal. I think we must not make it just beyond a a a a post or a statement i think we have to begin to teach this um in a more i think we lost them go ahead david Pastor yeah. david so so i'm I'm, make, I'm gonna make a couple of uh statements and um yeah uh they they haven't always made me the popular guy uh, in fact, in some ways, I think they've they've it's, they've censored me in some ways. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say it uh, anyway. Oh, uh, go ahead, Pastor. To... Go ahead, David. Yeah. So, uh, and now I'm a conservative theological uh, uh, pastor. I want to be careful with, uh, by saying that. Um, however, uh, I'm moving further and further away from speaking my, of myself as an evangelical because of so much of the craziness and ugliness going on there. But there's a, there, there's a scholar, or there was a scholar by the name of Dr. James Cone. He wrote a book called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. And in it, he says that the cross can hurt and heal. Uh, it can be empowering and liberating, but it'll all, it has also been enslaving and oppressive. There's no one way in which the cross can be interpreted now, he says that he offers his 
reflections because he believed that the cross placed alongside the lynching tree can help us see Jesus in America in a, a new light and thereby empower people who claim to follow him to take a stand against white supremacy and every kind of injustice. I, I want to ask the question when, when it said like, what should, what are we expecting from the church? Uh, I almost want to say, uh, what are we talking about? The question is, what is the what is expected of the church? Not what are we expecting of the church, but what is expected of the church okay. by God um, through his scriptures and what he's left us with. Uh, what you'll find is this, that the work of the prophets in the scripture uh, was not a work of guessing what kind of car he was going to have. Uh, but literally, the work of the prophets of scripture was to, a matter of fact, they were raised up by God to stand up and to confront two things. And, and, there, and there are two sides of the same cone. One, idolatry. The second side of that coin is injustice. Idolatry and injustice. Every single time what they were raised up to do was to speak against idolatry and injustice because idolatry always um, evolves itself into injustice. Anytime I dishonor the character of God, I dishonor the creation of God. And so, and so the prophets were raised up to confront idolatry and injustice and then to speak words of a better tomorrow where there would be no more idolatry or injustice. And so uh, I think the question is, what is expected of the church? And the scriptures tell us what's expected of the church. The scriptures say that's what's expected of the church is that we will love justice and, and that we would walk faithfully and humbly before our God. So we really, part of what we have going on right now, we're seeing the deficiency of, of, of theological depth, the deficiency of, of uh, ethical depth in the life of the church. The first question, watch this, I preached this on yesterday. Uh, the first question that the disciples asked post-crucifixion or, or post-resurrection and pre-ascension of Jesus, they asked Jesus a question. And the question they asked him, this is amazing. The question they ask him is, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, I need you to catch this. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They were asking, will you at this time restore us to superiority? Will you at this time make mm. us to be uh, the, the ones who run things and to whom everybody else got to kiss the ring? Right? Make America great again? Exactly. That, that's the question they asked. And Jesus' answer, that's Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Jesus' answer in, in uh, verse 7 is, y'all talking about the whole wrong thing. We're not talking about that. It's not for you to know times or seasons. Then verse number 8, he responds and he says, here's the answer. Here's my priority. My priority is that you'll receive the Holy Spirit and he's going to give you power. Now, in order to understand what that power is, you got to go to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter two, it says that when the promise, what well, he gave them as a response to their desire for superiority, the, the promise was of the Holy Spirit, the way it manifested itself was in tongues. The question is, what is this tongues? It wasn't just ecstatic speech. It was literally the ability to speak another's language, the ability to speak another's language, which implies humility and entering into someone else's story. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying that the literal first question of the Christian church, the first question was a question of superiority. The disciples who had walked with Jesus, their question is, are you going to make us great again? Jesus says, no, I'm not going to make you great again. I'm going to make my kingdom great by making it a diverse kingdom. Right. That, that's just that's just that part. But the scriptures in its entirety is dealing with this reality of how we desire power over somebody else and how God, by, the, by his son, is, is liberating us from this complex of superiority that we might become part of his kingdom. So, so it, I'll just say one last thing and then I'll be quiet because I go on forever uh, as far as the expectation of the church in the season. Listen, the church ain't never, ever, ever going to help nobody in this conversation until we change our whole conversation. We're not going to be able to move things forward until we start seeing color. I'm going to say it again. We're not going anywhere until we begin to see and celebrate color. 
The narrative that the church, the evangelical, I'll say the white evangelical church has given and has taught and, 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 and by proxy has taught our country is that we should pursue color blindness. And there's some real issues with that. Lies. Color blindness, number one, is fake. We do have distinction. And the idea of color blindness hinders us from recognizing the distinction we have. Hence, recognizing distinct challenges between us. Hence, the undermining of systemic injustice. Until we see and acknowledge color or distinction, we won't appreciate our distinct challenges. We need to begin to not teach away color, but instead to begin to see each other's color, enter into that experience, learn something about our distinctions so that we might be able to speak into distinctions, but nobody ever reacts to something they're not impacted by or affected by. We only react to things that we're affected by. So if you're not, con if you're not connected to people different than you, I, I'm never going to expect you to be affected by my, my struggle, right? And so I think right. we got a problem. Yeah. One is theological and biblical. Another is you just, you just not around nobody close enough to feel for them so you're not reacting. So we need uh -huh. to teach better Bible, and then so we got to do something better, get people in community. I'm All sorry. right. I'm going to let Dr. Lee go ahead and talk, but I'm glad you see that's that's the David I know. He he don't, he don't, he don't, he don't, he don't, he don't um, put that wheel in motion, Serica. You know, I don't like to call him radical, but he hasn't defined the name yet. But go ahead, Dr. Lee. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to um, address the question what should the church be doing? Um, I think we definitely have to. Um, look back at what the church has done. I think it is a, a it is a, a gross um, misunderstanding to say that the church was ineffective or that the church has done nothing. Um, my PhD dissertation was on African American women who came of age during the civil rights movement and the practical theological tools that they used to overcome. So I sat with the mothers. I sat with them as they told their stories and how they overcame oppression because they said, this is for us. This is not for me, this is for us. So the audacity of the signs that say, this isn't your grandmother's march is disrespectful on so many levels. It, every time I see it, it irks me because I said, if you had half of the energy, pride and courage that our ancestors had, ancestors had I promise you we'd be further. But <clears throat> that's in no way discrediting what they're doing, but let's not discredit our ancestors. We definitely have to hold on to the motion of Sankofa. We definitely have to know where we've been so that we can remember, so we can know where we're going. Because there was a Medgar Evers who was killed in his driveway. There was Fannie Lou Hamer who marched and was beaten so badly that she'd suffered injuries for the rest of her life. We had people, effective leaders. What happened to them? They killed them. They're dead. We have leaders now, but you know what? They want to see their children grow up. So they're not going to talk too loud because they don't want to die. Like that's a real concern. Like I want to see my children graduate and get married. But <clears throat> what happened was we made progress. We had some things overturned. Oh, um, segregation became illegal. Amazing, amazing strides. We had a black president. We had African-Americans in places and positions that we never had. And we got comfortable because we decided we didn't have to fight anymore. So the church has said, take away the labels. Labels are bad now. I'm no longer a black church. I am a church and we welcome everyone here because labeling as black became a bad thing, became exclusive instead of inclusive. What we forget is that the black church has always been inclusive. Y'all just didn't let us in your church. So we had to start our own. It was never a, well, y'all can't come over here. You were always welcome to come over here. Go ahead and you were welcome there. to go over there. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Pastor. No, I just said, go ahead and say that. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so instead of moving <laughs> along with our freedom, instead of saying, all right, now we're still going to fight, we basically shunned those black dollars that built these beautiful ephesuses, these beautiful youth ministries, million dollar facilities. And we now said, oh, God wants us all to prosper. Don't get me started. Don't get me started on the foolishness. 
I'm not saying we are supposed to suffer in silence, but I am saying we lost focus and decided that instead of building our communities, instead of buying our blocks, we started buying Rolls Royces. We started saying, you know what? God wants me not only to be oh blessed, but blessed. What? So in that, we lost we mm. lost sight of what was going on. So now those very things that our ancestors, our grandmothers, our grandfathers had to deal with, they're having to deal with again. Why aren't we organized? Because we forgot. Why aren't we organized? And one of the, the questions I took the most time on when I interviewed these mothers was, what would you tell the people today about what you had to do then? And I just sat and listened and recorded it and listened to it again. Because what they said was, don't forget, baby. Don't forget. It was the community. It was the church. It was the multifacetedness of the church that empowered us, that fed us, that gave us laughter and rejoicing. The churches aren't doing that now because we're closed Monday through Friday. We open up on Sunday morning for 17 services, but then you're not open no more. No, you can't come in because we don't trust you. We'll pray for you over the phone and you can catch us online. How do we build community that way? And God forbid somebody mm -hmm. cute and young comes up. Oh, she's not called. So I'll forever be Dr. Lee. But when I come to your church, oh, no, pastor, <laughs> evangelist. No, we can't do that. There's so many right layers. Right there, girl, over here. <laughs> I'm, oh, let me, let, me, let me relax. There's layers right, to right, this right. in making sure that not only we aren't oppressing ourselves, but we aren't helping others to oppress us. Now, as for the looting, as for the riots, we also have to be careful that we aren't throwing out the baby with the bathwater. We have lost lives. And when I say we, I mean African-American communities have lost lives. For you to lose a couple of dollars, some T-shirts and some windows is nothing compared to George uh, Floyd's mother never seeing her son again. So I, I, I want to mm. be politically correct and educated because I am, but miss me with the BS. Say it. it I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do it. Sarica. Yeah. Sarica. I, I I know I know you sitting yeah, here like I got a I lot got to, to say. say I, I want you to talk about women. Also be in the right. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, sis. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I, no, I want to talk on um, um Go ahead. No, to talk about, well, she started out, uh, Dr. Lee started out talking about um, Black women and their uh, contribution to the movement um, during civil civil rights. And, um, you know, it is because of those women that I am as vocal and um, unpolitically correct as I am today. So uh, I stand on their shoulders. I, I am as vocal as I am because of those women. So I, I feel you when I see uh, those comments and, and different posts about we are not our ancestors. Um, we are our ancestors. Um, we, we are our ancestors' wildest dreams if we allow ourselves to be. And I am not one of those people who who won't say it to anybody. I, we all have to address ourselves on every level, from the church to the politicians, to the people standing on the street corner, to the parents, the mothers, the education system, everybody has to address themselves. So when we talk about this movement right now and where we are with women, um, black women, we are leading the charge right now. We are as vocal and as strong and uh, not, we are not bowing down. We are not going to always be uh, those uh, Southern bells who don't say anything and just, you know, be quiet. I, I, I am const I'm going against what my grandmother told me when I do everything I'm doing right now, because uh, during that time, I was told that uh, young girls are supposed to be seen and not heard. So uh, I, I am I'm doing the complete opposite of that. Black women at, right now, we are leading the charge and we're doing it in such a way that we don't mind, but we do need more support when we do it. Because most of the time, most of the time when we're out there, uh, 
there's maybe 60% women and you may get the rest to be men and they're not a, as, as vocal and they're not standing as strong. There's no reason why not even in protesting, just in life period, that black women should be more protected right now. Black women should have more black men standing up for them right now. Uh, we don't have that going on in our communities anymore. We have black men who, um, and this is an attack on black men. I don't even want that to sound like I'm going that way. But when we start addressing issues, we got to put we got to put everything where it is. You know, you got to take yours just like I got to take mine. And and, and the, this is where we are as black women that we're carrying a load. We're carrying a load of the civil rights right now of Black Lives Matter because our sons and husbands are being murdered. So we know what it is to be a black man. And we are afraid that our black boys won't ever know what it's like to be a black man because they're not able to grow up. So, you know, listening to black women more, you know, a allowing them to have the floor. And if they are the smartest one in the room, then follow them. Don't put, try to put us back in the kitchen and keep us silent. We have taken this movement to everybody and we don't cower. We're not falling behind because it's a police officer, because of it's, it's a politician. Black women will get up in your face and not back down. And we need black people and black men to stand behind us when we are doing that, because it's not us, it's not me that I'm doing it for, it's us. Because if it was just me, I could be home eating some butter pecan ice cream. I hear you. So I have this question here, you know, when it comes to our family, um, you know, I have a 16 year old, um, Dr. Lee, your kids are kind of smaller. Um, um, David, you have a what, 10, maybe 11 year old, Ooh, 11 year old girl. Um, uh, Sarah, you have, uh, I think a teenager. Yeah. So are we having that discussion about what's really going, do they know what's going on? Cause you know, my daughter wanted to come out on, um, Saturday, but they changed the location. So we didn't know about the other until later. So I was going to go and carry her and her friends there, but I had to explain, hey, let me tell you what's really going on. I don't want you to go out there because you keep, because she knew about stuff before I did, you know, through, you know, they know about tech, they know everything, you know, um, before we do. So are we, are we talking to our children about what's going on? Do they know that this is right now um, such a history and time to be written down that, that I would assume that would be in the books that will be talked about, you know, doing lectures, you know, years to come and universities and such. Are we having discussions with our family that, but are we having discussions with our husband and wife or just, just period. Are we having that discussion in the home? Go ahead, David. Go ahead, David. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, I, I don't know if enough of us are. I know that's for me uh, in my household. Uh, yeah, we're having we're having that conversation <laughs> thoroughly, and not just when it happens, uh, but throughout the year. Not only am I having it with my uh, my biological kids but I got a bunch of mentees all around and I'm having this conversation with them as well. But as far as my kids, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I've, I've raised my children um, speaking to distinction and our colors. And so I'll tell my kids, I say, hey man, you know, Uncle Jay? They say, yeah, I say, I say, isn't he like the funniest? Don't you love your black Uncle Jay? Right. Um, and they'll say, yeah. And I'll do the same thing with the white uncles and aunties and all this kind of stuff. And we speak to and celebrate our distinction on a regular basis. Uh, but I also train them in the word of God and in uh, life. Um, I think my daughter, she's again, she's going to be 12 in November. My son is seven and I got a newborn. Um, and nobody's going to train them uh, more than I am. I'm just not going to have it. Uh, my wife ain't going to have it neither. Uh, and so she's been active. Uh, in training them. Uh, we took our daughter out there with us on yesterday. Um, you know, so she was out there in the protest with us. 
uh, we've spoken, we do, you know, we teach them uh, American, real American, real American history on a regular basis. Um, right. And, and so, and so we took her out there with us. She walked the streets with us, uh, chanted with us, all of that kind of stuff. But one of the things, um, that I think is important is that, uh, not only are we taking them along with us and not only are we just kind of going ahead and telling them things, but, um, we're creating space for them to come with their questions to us, ask us questions and, to, uh, and then connecting them intentionally, right? with all sorts of people. So now, as a, I said yesterday at church, I'm a born again, New Yorican black man in that order. And the reason I said that is because number one, society has just said, I got to check a box. Either I'm white or I'm black. And the right. store clerk who <laughs> just racially profiled me, right? She decided I was black as well, right? And so that's just, that's just the categories they've created. And so I just got to check it off. Um, but the reality is we can't be afraid and we can't let the whitewashed church and whitewashed Christianity change the narrative. We do have distinction. It's an interesting thing. I'll shut up right here. Interesting thing. In the beginning of the book in Genesis, it speaks to our distinction, right? And then the, at the end of the book, in, in the book of Revelation, right, God decides not that he would forget about our distinction even in the eschaton or in the end or in heaven or new Jerusalem. He decides he's not going to forget about it, but that at the very end of the book, he wants to talk about it over and over again. Five plus times he talks about every tribe, tongue, and nation. He don't got to do that, but he does. He talks about it over and over again about how uh, in the end, in the perfect world, if you would, it's going to be all sorts of distinction. So I think we need to get creative. I think we need that. We, we have a million ways we can teach our children. If we would just come to a place where we are comfortable talking about distinction and we're celebrating our distinction. So I have a question here. And um, the question is, and if we could just, just for a couple of seconds, talk on it. Um, are we looking for Hollywood? Hollywood. The question is, where is Hollywood? You know, like, um, have we have they been too quiet? The Tyler Perry's, you won't call them out. The Oprah Winfrey's, the Gales, the the let me see the 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 uh, all these people who we see, you know, doing these things, the TikToks and all. You know, they 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 they're there vocally. You know, uh, the Diddies. Um, I keep calling names. You know, where are they? Then all of a sudden today. A lot of them popped up because they thought it was over. You know, like, what's up? Like, I'm, 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 I don't, I don't, it's that thing that young people now, like, I don't see you now. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, young people now are very progressive and you have to accept them as they are. Very progressive. It's like, like I don't see them, whatever. You know, like, where are they? Are we, you know, people was looking for them, but they're not there. Even the politicians, like, where y'all at? Go ahead. Anybody? Sarah? You shaking your head. Did you have an expectation um, to see them? Or you, you know, not one. I didn't. Ha I didn't have any expectation of an actress to do anything other than act. I don't have an expectation of anybody <laughs> in Hollywood to do anything other than what they are doing. I, well, the people I listen to are the people who have been, um, and I'm not going to say just listen to. Um, but the people I look to to start speaking are the people who are, have been speaking. Your Sean Kings, um, your uh, Angela Davis, uh, all of these people are commentators who are constantly talking about our issues. Those are the people who I'm listening to and and following as of where we're going in our direction because they've done the research. They know what's going on. They're not just impulsively saying something because now uh, our, their fans are asking them to say something. They're saying something when no one is listening. They're saying something when no one is watching. They're saying something when no one even cares to figure out what's going on with um, the economy, how is it affecting us? They're, they've been speaking, that's their job. That's what they do. Those are the people I look to. So when you have somebody like uh, Lil Wayne, I am a Lil Wayne fan. I grew up with the hot boys. I am Lil Wayne to death. 
but I will not ask Lil Wayne any thought provoking questions because I don't right. want to hear it. I want to hear, I want to hear you rap. I, I need to hear Lil Wayne. I need to hear, you know, New Orleans. That's what I'm looking for from you. So when we, when we try to get people to speak outside of their area of expertise, we get dumb things said. We get people pushed back who have a platform so massive that people are hearing this craziness that you're saying, and you can liken it to anything that 45 says. Just like he say something crazy, Lil Wayne just says something crazy. So I don't separate the crazy talk. It's crazy because he don't know what he's talking about and neither does Lil Wayne. So, uh, you know, we got to get away right. from giving Hollywood so much credit when it comes to civil rights issues and issues within the black community. When it came to when it came to O.J. Simpson, uh, when O.J. Simpson, the juice man, he made it out. He didn't consider himself black anymore. He didn't think he, he was O.J. He's just like, I'm just O.J. I'm not black. I'm just O.J. But as soon as he got on trial. He came back to the black community wanting all of our support and help now. So no, I, I don't I don't want us to, you know, put so much example. onto these actors and, and seem to do anything because they have made it to a point where they are comfortable in where they are and they have to do whatever they need to do to maintain their money, to keep their business coming in, their fans coming in. They are appeasing fans i don't want to hear from you if you haven't already had a platform that speaks on these issues and we got to stop expecting and waiting for them to say anything remotely resembling intelligence because they are not coming from that point all right david one minute like you got something to say <laughs> no 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 i'm I'm, ju I'm just saying yeah the sister's right listen I ain't worried about what Hollywood got to say, but I asked, where's the pastors? Uh, that, I think that's a good question um, because they've been real quiet too. Um, as far as Hollywood, listen, yes, I, I'm just, it's, it's my neighborhood, my community. Um, it, it's, it's our community. Uh, we got to take it. Listen, ain't nobody going to take care of us for us. We got to take care of ourselves. Uh, we got to take care of our communities. I'm a pastor um, and a neighbor. Uh, it's my responsibility twofold. Uh, to take care of my community. Uh, she said it, I, I, man, listen, Sarika said everything uh, that I feel like needed to be said there. Um, let's, we got to hold ourselves down. Um, let's take care of our own communities, take care of our own neighborhoods. I'll get the past perspective one more time. Uh, Jesus left us two commands, love God, love neighbor. If we're not doing that, we're not doing anything. Lee, you have anything to add to that? Well, y'all, I'm going to just disagree with you because I do expect them okay. to say something. They don't have to be um, intellectually astute. They don't have to be the most, um, <clears throat> you know, amazing orator. If you can't say it, retweet somebody else's. But don't f forget about the community that nourished you. Don't forget about the community when you come out with your new shoes and your new clothing line that you want to buy from you. You can't celebrate our dollars, but ignore our bodies. I expect 100%. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, where Breonna Taylor was killed. So in my hometown, when they started to march and they started to protest, I was looking for the voices. I was looking for the basketball players. I was looking for the University of Louisville. Where are you all? When I grew up, I grew up from the same high school Muhammad Ali went to, and he wasn't a celebrity because he was always around. We expected to see him. We expected his voice. We expected him to be there. And he wasn't the most loquacious person and he wasn't that eloquent, but he at least was there to show, I support you. I expect the same thing from them. I was pleased when I saw Nick Cannon marching. And I'd be pleased if I had seen more faces as well. Yeah. You know what? And it was Don Lemon. He was talking. He kind of went on a rant a little bit. And I'm tired of y'all texting me. He was talking about his friends. Then mm. he started calling names. He said, y'all texting me saying this. Oh, it's a shame. And this and this. And this. But you're not saying nothing. You just texting me. You're not, you're not making your voice heard. And you and um, I feel, you know, on both sides of the coin because you are right. They're looking for you to watch their movie. They're looking for you to watch their Netflix. They're looking for you to support them on this. They're looking for you to buy their tickets, you know, and they're looking for that black dollar. They are, that black dollar is powerful. So they're looking for it, you know, they're looking mm -hmm. for those things. So I have one, one more last um, little subject here before we get off because they are coming into time. It's a local issue. It's a local issue. Now, um, I know something did happen. Um, 
big shout outs to um, Officer Smith for handling that situation at the Fort Lauderdale uh, when the officer um, hit or kicked the young lady who was down, hands up. Uh, I think her face is uh, that that particular photo has gone viral. Um, you know, big ups to her for for getting in his face and telling him to move down and, you know, needs to be done. Um, but also what about when officers or politicians tweet and they make comments on Facebook? Um, quite a few of them have been fired. I know one young lady, ex-prosecutor, has been fired, Amy uh, Bloom. And then we have two um, here on local news. Uh, BSO Broward County Sheriff's two officers or I think on a, on a suspended leave um, for making a statement um, on Facebook. But you see so many other officers who are making statements. They're coming out, they're speaking for, they're speaking against. Um, how do you guys feel about it? I mean, should we, I know one person right now, Sarah, who is from Pompano, uh, Ron Thurston, um, you know, he has his big support. They're about to do something on next week um, in trying to make sure that he keeps his job. Um, like, are we, do we even want to hear from them? Should they even be tweeting? I know there's some type of bylaws or laws to it. You know, what is the expectation? Go ahead, Sarah, because I know next week. So um, when it comes to law, when it comes to law enforcement, I don't try to push my personal view of law enforcement on people, but I do try to educate them on what law enforcement is and has been to uh, the black communities and how their their policies and ethics and laws that they enforce disproportionately affect the black community. So in reference to what Ron Thurston said, Ron Thurston's post was uh, to point out the racial inequalities within uh, different departments in BSO that lack black leadership and lack black officers to even uh, reflect the communities that they're going into um, versus a, a law enforcement officer or deputy who posts, um, he wasn't killed. He uh, couldn't breathe, if he, he wasn't killed he was talking so he can breathe. It was drugs. You know, someone who completely removed any responsibility from law enforcement where everyone can clearly see that this man was murdered because this officer, uh, just without any care in the world, um, kept his knee on his neck for eight minutes. So you have officers who are saying things that are for the killer. And if you are speaking to defend the killer, that that to me is what needs to be addressed. Not someone who is pointing out racial inequalities within the law enforcement department that they work in. He took a chance by saying that. And he knew he, he had to know that his job would be on the line. But if we want to say there's a such thing as good cops, what he did was good for the community, good for the world right now. So we can see what's really going on inside of BSO and not just be told these blanketed converse, blanketed statements about our, us being diverse in BSO by the sheriff, yet you have someone who can show where there isn't that diversity. There isn't a reflection of the black community being in leadership within your agency. So those are two separate things. If you're gonna penalize someone the same as you would someone who is preaching hate and spewing uh, these things that you don't want us to think about you, if you're punishing them the same way, then you're saying, hey, we don't want you. We don't want you to say anything about what we're doing in here. Keep your mouth closed and keep business as usual. So um, I, I, I'm not. I'm not for it, him being uh, suspended for that reason. But I am. I'm, I am for these law enforcement officers being suspended because of their hatred that they're spewing online because that's really what it is is racism and hatred when you are aligning yourself with someone who has been a known racist and a person who consistently has a record of being 
a bad officer. So you're aligning yourself with them. Birds of a feather flock together. Have you guys see the information, Dr. Lee or Pastor David, in regards to that um, situation? I'll just say that um, there are, you know, the law for us, the, um, any agency have their particular rules or laws as to how, you know, we sign these disclosures um, when it comes to social media or so forth. Now, um, I would say, um, should he have been reprimanded um, if that's part of their agreements or, or bylaws or disclosure laws? Um, absolutely. But should it have been in a manner of 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 going to someone's home, scripting scripting them of their badge, doing it so malicious, you know, like hey, uh, you know, so much ownership, I guess, of doing it, you know, you you ain't doing no different than a, than the lynching, you know. I'm just stripping you of your rights. I'm just telling you, you're not this person. You're not a man. You disgrace us. Um, I believe in 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 people being unity of what they're a part of. David, your unity when you're part of preachers. Uh, but when wrong is wrong, wrong is wrong. You understand what I'm saying? If if you're a law enforcement, they have this thing of 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 of, of um you know, being part of, of the blue system, you know, we're part of the blue, but we're wrong is wrong, wrong is wrong. And if someone has to point it out um, verbally for it to be heard, then you've probably been sending letters and doing so, then it had to be done, then it was done. But I do believe they should give him his job back. I don't think that necessarily saying that you should be fired. I think that's something as a as a as a learning, you know, what do we need to do in our system? Because he did break it down that we have one this, one this, one this, one this, and one this, and know this and know this in our system when it comes to um, you know, African Americans or even Hispanics or even, you know, our brown and and, and well, our brown and brown brothers. I don't call us black, our brown and brown brothers when it comes to um law enforcement. And um, but yeah, I and I support that. You know, I support that on next week. You know, everything that that has to do with it. I I do hope that that's something that he get his job. Like I don't think that we should be stripped when when we see a flaw in our system. Yeah, but this has been good, guys. I mean, we've already to our eight o'clock hour. Actually, a little bit over eight. I thank you guys for being a part of the Table Talk uh, radio show, you know, come back again. Um, and I would say to Sarah, you don't have to hold back, honey. Just say what you got to say. Because I know you, I, I, I know your personality. So that's something that I would expect. I expect everyone to be on. I, I, like I said, when you're on Facebook, be your own authentic self. You know, people will, will, when I say the things that I said on Facebook this weekend, I didn't think it was saying bad, but you'll get that in my, well, do you mean that? You better be careful. Be careful about what? <laughs> I'm a grown woman. You know, be careful about who? You understand what I'm saying? And that, that that tells you, you need to dumb it down. It tells you, don't, 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 don't rock the boat because you got, you know, you got these clients or you got these people or you associate with this organization. No, no, no. Tanisha will be Tanisha. Accept Tanisha as she is. If that's something that you can't accept, I don't. I, I mean, you just. I don't need to be a part of your life. I don't need to be a part of the organization. Delete me. That's the only thing that I can say. So don't send me stuff. And I'm saying this to people who listen. Don't send me techno you know, saying why you said that or or you better be careful. No, you need to say something. Maybe you need to say something. And and I want to say one thing to this to all the other people. Don't criticize people after the fact of everything has been done. You know, after people get out and do what they do, I'm so tired of this criticism. You know, now we want to criticize this. Oh, it should have been this. If you're not a part of it being a solution, just don't say nothing, right? Just don't say nothing. Anybody else and they have any sound off they need to say for a couple of seconds? I say it by sound off. <laughs> any sound off? <laughs> So we all good. All right, guys. So thank you for being a part of the table talk. You got some Lee? Not Lee? Uh -uh, I'm too long winded to end it out. I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> all right, dear. all right. So, guys, thank you so much for being a part of the Table Talk uh, Radio Show, and thank you guys for listening out there. If you have any comments, make sure you can put them in now, or even ask the questions after the show is over. Um, go to our social media page, Table Talk Media. Make sure you like that page. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and send it to Table Talk. Um, 
what is it, table talk. Um, I got so many emails, Lord Jesus have mercy. Um, just just send send it to me, Tanisha Simkins at gmail.com. I'll go ahead and respond. All right, guys, you staying on the line. One moment. You stay on the line. <laughs> 